Hey everybody, welcome to the Tiny Studio. It's your girl Nail, and this is Simply Nail's Tiny Studio. How are you doing? I hope that you are having a fantastic day. I'm having a great day, a great pain-free day, because let me tell you, for the past week and a half, I've been dealing with arthritis in my feet, and let me tell you something, arthritis, oh wait, you remember how we used to laugh at uh, Fred G. Stanford? Fred G. Sanford on Sanford and Son when he would talk about how he had the arthritis <laughs> and he would tell Lamont he would tell Lamont he couldn't get any work done because he had the arthritis so we would laugh and I would laugh too and I thought that was hilarious and you know what it was hilarious until well everything is hilarious right until it happens to you and then when it happens to you it's not so funny anymore is it no, it's not. I broke my foot maybe about 25 plus years ago and the orthodontic, uh, orthopedic, or not orthodontic, the orthopedic surgeon told me those 25 plus years ago that arthritis would eventually set into my foot and that I would have to deal with arthritis uh, in my, you know, more mature years. So, you know, I was like 20 something back then. I was like 24, 25 years old. And so, you know, hey, I wasn't thinking about the future. I wasn't thinking about my older self. I wasn't thinking about that, you know, because, you know, according to Prince, after 1999, the world is going to be over, right? So why am I thinking about stuff that's going to happen, you know, my concept of time was really, really warped, okay, and it had a lot to do with my religious upbringing, because at one point, you know, when I graduated in 1985, I didn't believe that 1990 was cut, was, <laughs> I didn't believe there was going to be a 1990, okay, and if you know, if I didn't believe there was going to be a 1990, I sure enough did not believe there was going to be a 2000, and definitely, I I just knew there wasn't going to be a 2023 child. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Not with me being, you know, a mature woman and, and I'm walking around with aches and pains and, and, and white hair. <laughs> I didn't think that. You couldn't tell me that back then. But here we are. The world is still turning. And I am a middle-aged woman. And arthritis has indeed set into my feet, child. And for the past week and a half, I've been going through some pain. Mm -hmm. Girl, I would not wish arthritis on my worst enemy. I would not. I would not. Just, the pain is just ridiculous. But I've been doing, um, I've been able to get the inflammation down. And I've been doing that by using some turmeric and um, also using some essential oils to get the inflammation down and that has worked wonderfully and I was able to sleep okay without being in tremendous pain last night so you know I'm feeling good I'm feeling really good so how are you I hope that you are doing well if you haven't already subscribed to Simply Nails Tiny Studio please go ahead and do so. We have a book club once a week where right now we are reading from Prince Harry's memoir called Spare. Tune in on those days. I'm going to, um, I'm going to drop the book club, um, for every, for every Wednesday. So every Wednesday, tune in for book club. And on that day, we will be reading from, Spare by Prince Harry, and then I just received, um, I just received Ginger, um, Ginger Duggar. If you are a Duggar family, uh, a Duggar, if you are a fan of the Duggar family, Ginger Duggar, and I think that she is daughter number, well, she is child number five of that crew. She just wrote a book, and it's called, um, Becoming Free Indeed, where she talks about breaking away from the religion that she was born into. And she talks about how to break away from um, a religion that you're not cool with. 
how to break away from it. And uh, she calls it disentangling oneself. How to disentangle oneself from religiosity and how to keep your faith. Okay. How to continue to believe in Jesus Christ. So I'm reading that right now. It's a quick read. It's, it's a really good book. Um, if you're into the Duggars, I will be getting ready to have um, uh, include her book in our book club uh, selection for, uh, I'm thinking for the month of February, because we're, we're rolling into February right now. So within the next couple of weeks, we'll get into it. Um, I'm excited about it, though. And I was thinking about really getting into it because you guys have been asking me questions about uh, me being a former Jehovah's Witness. And you've been asking me questions about, um, you know, why did I make the decision to, you know, and I shouldn't say former because technically I am in uh, an inactive Jehovah's Witness. So... You know, I've gotten questions about what does that mean? You know, why, you know, did you leave the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses? So I'll probably get into that while I am uh, in book club. I'll get into that while we're discussing um, Ginger's book. How does that sound? All right, so let's just get into whatever it is we're going to be doing today. Today, we're going to be talking about that crazy Governor DeSantis and that drama he has over here in Florida. Well, actually, we're going to be talking about two crazy things going on over here in Florida, okay? We're going to be talking about the Bethune-Cookman University situation. Mm -hmm. We're going to get into that. We're going, to get, we're going to get into that. And we're also going to talk about Crazy DeSantis and his Stop Woke Act and the fact that he has basically torpedoed and uh, a, a program, uh, an African-American studies program, a pilot, the pilot African-American studies program that uh, student high school students could take to earn credit or to earn college credits. We're going to talk about that too. But in the meantime, child, I am drinking my Octavia Butler tea. And I get this tea from a sister named Sunyata. And I can't think of her last name right now. Her name, her name is Sunyata. And she has her own uh, tea shop. And I believe it's in Washington, D.C. But she's online as well. So I'm thinking you can find her. If you listen to the Karen Hunter show um, on Sirius XM, then she is usually on um, Karen's show for um, on Wellness Wednesdays. So she has a website uh, and um, where you can buy all, you know, different teas and things. And I'm loving this Octavia Butler tea. It's, it's, it's great. It's in tribute to Octavia, Octavia Butler, the um, awesome, the awesome sci-fi author. And, you know, um, Octavia Butler right now, one of her books called Kindred is streaming on Hulu. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Sunyata made this delicious tea in honor of Octavia Butler, and it's called Octavia Butler, and it is just a very, very delicious tea. And I think I talked about it before, because if you drink it, if you drink it straight, it's purple, right? But if you add lemon to it, it turns blue. Mm -hmm. That's in tribute to the fabulous and wonderful Octavia Butler. But today I'm going to be working on my Granny Afghan project. And if you recall, this is the Baked Sweet Potatoes Lapgan. And you remember it's called Baked Sweet Potatoes because, you know, this beautiful, beautiful orange yarn Reminds me of sweet potatoes. And then that beautiful Lions brand skeins, brown skeins. Um, it's not called brown skein. What is it called? Anyhow, Lion brand has a whole line of beautiful, beautiful uh, yarn. I think it's called Hue. 
I can't remember. Anyhow, the colors in that um, the Lion Brand um, yarns that are filled with the, the different types of browns, I just adore it. And I just don't know if I adore it because it features the brown, the brownness, the different brown yumminess of African American women. I don't know if I love that 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 line because of that, or because the browns remind me of caramel and brown sugar and nutmeg and cinnamon brownie color. Oh, I just don't know, but I love it so much, and so I incorporated it into this granny lapkin. If you have been following me here on Simply Nails Tiny Studio, you have watched this afghan grow. So yes, it's getting larger. We're getting there. We're getting there. I was supposed to have this project done by Halloween of last year. But if you, you recall, or if you're regular to the channel, you, re you will remember that I, <laughs> that I developed Knitter's Elbow from crocheting so much. So I had to put the hook down for about three weeks almost. And so that set a lot of projects that I wanted to have ready by um, Halloween or before Thanksgiving that set a lot of those projects back. And I'm still playing catch up. Can you believe that? I'm still playing catch up. So with this project, I'm using a size five millimeter hook. And today I'm using my clover hook and if you know if you don't know about uh this granny about granny squares granny squares cons uh, are made from double crochet clusters or we call them the granny granny square clusters so if you you can continue, once you make your granny square, um, you continue to build on the basic granny square, granny square premise with your premise with your granny, with your uh, double crochet clusters or granny clusters. And if you keep on, then eventually your granny square will turn into a granny lapkin and then eventually into a granny blanket or I've seen a uh, granny square blanket I've seen uh, people here on YouTube crocheters here on YouTube turn their granny squares into many many beautiful different projects I've seen granny square purses granny square shawls Granny square hats, granny square scarves, granny square jackets, just granny square coats. You know, you could do so many things with granny squares. I really, I really do believe that within the last couple of years, granny squares have, you know, made a really huge resurgence because that's one of the basic things that you you learn how to make when you're first starting out with uh, starting to crochet. That's one of the things you begin to learn. You learn how to make it the granny square because it is the the repetition of the stitches that makes you proficient at it. So in this, in the granny square blanket, uh, what's the pattern that's being repeated is principally your double crochet because the granny square is created through double crochet clusters of three. So you learn or master the stitch of, you know, of double crochet by making uh, granny squares. And as I said, that's one of the principal things that you start off learning when you begin to crochet. Well, not me exactly. <laughs> Because let me tell you, when I started crocheting again, I first started, um, when I first learned how to crochet, I think I was about nine years old. My grandmother showed me how, 
And so when I started back, and I, you know, I crochet on and off throughout my life, you know. Yeah, I pick up the hook and some yarn and crochet, you know, and then I put it back down. But um, I really started crocheting again about five years ago. Maybe six years come this, six years come this uh, July. It'll be six years that I've been crocheting full time. And when I started again, I started doing crazy stuff. I started making blankets. I started making full-fledged afghans. And when I say full-fledged blankets and afghans, I mean king-size, king-size blankets. Or I should say king-size afghans. That's what I started on. Um, they began as... Um, well, I did make... Uh, I made an oval... I made an oval blanket for my daughter. I did. I made an oval blanket for my daughter. I made another, I made a lapgan for my youngest daughter. And then I made two king size uh, afghans or crochet blankets for my mother and my grandmother. And they both have them. They sit prominently. My grandmother's, uh, she has my blanket sitting in her den and my mom, I believe she has her sitting in the uh, living room. They are beautiful. They're beautiful works of art. And that's what crochet means to me. Crochet for me is my way of painting. It's art. And I simply en enjoy it. I love it. It's, it's really a great pastime for me. But more importantly, it has become more so of a business because I also crochet scarves. Um, I crochet um, booties. Um, that's, you know, footies, feetwear. I crochet that as well. I crochet cows. As you can see, there's a cow behind me. I crochet cows. I crochet... Um, roster hats so this turned into a, a really cool business for me and that's what you know that's what you really want you want to be able to you know turn your passion into money and so that's what i've been doing turning my passion into money so if you are interested in a scarf or a roster hat you know let me know uh send me a direct message over at blue lotus hill designs Facebook page and let's chat or you can send me an email at um, blue lotus hill designs at outlook.com blue lotus hill designs is my the name of my company and that is where you will find uh, under my company umbrella it's a lot of my crochet goods and also my jewelry and right now I have on some blue lotus hill designs jewelry I have on an adjustable necklace pennant that has crystals on it. It has, uh, I believe that's some lapis, some malachite, some amethyst. What else is on here? And there's my amethyst uh, pennant there. Uh, I think there's some rose quartz here. I just love, 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 love crystals. And of course, on my ears are my amethyst, amethyst teardrop earrings. So, as I said before, there are some things going on in Florida that's really, you know, ridiculous. And let's talk about it. First of all, let's get into Governor DeSantis, who recently torpedoed the... Uh, AP African American Studies class. Now he said the reasons he torpedoed it was because of some of the courses, some of the parts of the curriculum featured political indoctrination. And he noted that there was a part of the curriculum, a part of the African American Studies curriculum that featured queer theory. 
And he had an issue with that. He was like, you know, this is indoctrination. We don't want to be indoctrinating our we don't want our, we don't want subjects to and we don't want certain things to indoctrinate. We don't want our children to be indoctrinated with excuse me, certain subjects. And while I understand that with queer studies, I can understand where someone might think that it is queer indoctrination. Well, actually what the whole um, curriculum is really about, it's about embracing the entire African-American experience. That's what it's about. And it begins starting in Africa to give a foundation. It starts in Africa and then it, it, it makes its way over uh, from Africa to the transatlantic voyage that brought black bodies or African bodies to the Americas, um, to Spain, um, and to the Caribbean, also to uh, Great Britain or the UK. Now, yes, queer theory is a segment that's being taught in this or discussed in this AP class as part of the African American experience. And you may say, well, why is that necessary? Well, because there are key components of the African American experience which touches on the queer aspect of African American society. What we are not going to do is we're not going to begin to eliminate certain or silence certain parts of society that we feel are irrelevant based on our religious or our moral compass. That's what we're not going to do because when we attempt to oppress or suppress certain aspects of society based on our religious or our religiosity or based on our on our own moral compass about certain things, we we are suppressing or oppressing history. So when you talk about queer theory and you talk about what it is or why it's important, it's important because queer theory examines or sets forth a study on how homosexuality or how queerness interacts or leaves a fingerprint or a blueprint on how society develops, especially African-American society. So you may say, well, is there a queer studies component in the, the, the AP Japanese course or in the European AP European history course or in the AP um, course about Germany? You know, is there some sort of queer component there? I don't know because I've never seen, I haven't seen their, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't seen their curriculum. So I don't know personally. But what I do know is that there are several aspects of in African American history in this country where there is a queer component that should be discussed and should be acknowledged, such as the fact that the civil rights movement, including the March on Washington, would not have happened had there not been a queer aspect to it. You may say, <clears throat> you may say how? Then that's why you need to study the life of Bayard Rustin. Study the life of Bayard Rustin, who was a known homosexual, an African-American man. Study his life 
and you will find out what the queer component was. And remember, he is also, there would be no civil rights movement. There would be no, there would not have been a civil rights, uh, a, a march on Washington without Bayard Rustin, because it was his idea. And it was based on his queerness. That is why queer theory, queer studies is important. That's why getting to the meat of queer theory is going to aid in, in the studies of African Americans in this society, in this culture. That's why. When you look at the work of Angel, Dr. Angela Davis and how that spirit on the Black Power Movement, Angela Davis is a lesbian. She is queer. How did her queerness contribute to the Black Move, the Black Power Movement? What aspects of her queerness of her experience as a lesbian woman, black woman, how does that contribute to the movement? I know people say, well, let's separate sexuality from the discussion, but you can't separate sexuality from this discussion or from American studies, you can't separate it because that is who we are. We are sexual beings. Right now, someone is having a baby. Right now, a baby is being conceived. So we are, in essence, we are sexual beings. It's who we are. And the way we feel about things sexually has a lot to do with the way we see the world. Now, you may not believe that, but then again, who doesn't believe that? If, um, when I also think about queer theory, I think about the contributions of a lot of queer African Americans that has their, their, their lives shaped our history as African-Americans in this country. You think about the great Langston, he, Langston Hughes, I Too Sing America. What a wonderful poem. What a powerful poem. What a powerful, powerful poem. But Langston Hughes, was queer. Who else? He And he contributed a great deal to the landscape of the civil rights movement. And he contributed a great deal to African-American literature. He was part of the Harlem Renaissance, the time where African-American intellect was caught primarily on paper in various forms, which is music, art, and literature. Lacey Hughes was there and he was queer. But he felt the struggle too, the struggle of being a black man and a struggle of being queer. Audre Lorde, one of the most prolific poets of our time, she was queer as well, lesbian. But there are aspects of the women's rights movement that would not have been as successful as it was without the strength of Audre Lorde. So, when we say, oh, Lorraine Hansberry, who can forget her play that was turned into a movie called A Raisin in the Sun that talked about racial, racial segregation 
in housing. How can we forget Lorraine Hansberry? What I'm saying is When we say that something, educating someone and indoctrinating someone are two different things. Education and, 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 and indoctrination are two different things. Because we people, when you're educating someone, you're not pushing an agenda on them. What you're doing is you're helping, you're giving, you're, 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 you're giving kids and people knowledge so that they can be able to build on it. They can be able to add their bricks or add their, add their vegetable to the stew. When you are educating someone or giving, extending an education to students, I don't believe that it's indoctrination. I believe that it's education. There's no agenda behind African American studies. It's about making or helping people to become aware of who they are and what what type of culture and society they are a part of, especially as African Americans. Another reason why I believe uh, this Governor DeSantis just torpedoed the AP African American Studies program is because one of the contributors to the program is Kimberly Crenshaw, who was one of the co-founders of critical race theory. And I believe that one of her books is on intersectionality is featured within the program. It's a suggested reading. Now, critical race theory is taught in law school. That's number one. Number two, critical race theory is not the only thing that Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw teaches or that she writes about. And because um, also I believe there is because she is the co-founder of critical race theory and there's this thing going on that critical race theory is being taught in schools and critical race theory is such a bad thing to talk about. That's another reason why DeSantis and other people like him are poo-pooing it. Let me explain to you what critical race theory is. If just in case you do not know, critical race theory is a subject that's taught in law school. That's number one. Okay, so what critical race theory has to do with the law is the fact that the theory proposes that racism is threaded in the foundation of the justice system, system, the legal system. And that there are aspects of the legal system where racism, discrimination, white supremacy, where they are embedded within it. And because of this feature, structurally holds back the progress of African Americans in this country. That is what critical race theory is about. It's about going through the law 
and dissecting those pieces of law where racial discrimination, segregation are all entwined within it. Now, if you know anything about American history, then you also know that there were laws set up that were that were set up and meant to discriminate against African Americans. There's such a such thing as Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws, separate but equal. Don't teach your slave to read and write. That's critical race theory. So it's not something as DeSantis and other opponents of critical race theory say, it's not the fact that this is not real because it is real. History tells us that it's real. Sit in the back of the bus. That's a law. That was a law. That was a law. Critical race theory was real. Is real. So in this particular class in law school, that is what law students theorize or get to discuss and break down. Critical race theory is not taught in elementary schools. Critical race theory is not taught in high schools. Critical race theory is not taught to the general population of college students. But one political group in this country has decided to use the critical race theory as a calling card to, to, to weaponize itself and to, to use it as a tool to gain political points with known racists in this country. That's why you have people all over the country, you know, coming up to these, these, these school board meetings and saying, I don't want my kids learning about no CRT. Well, let me tell you something. Your kids aren't learning about CRT. Your five-year-old is not being taught CRT in the classroom. Okay. Your, your, your 10-year-old fifth grader is not learning CRT. They are not. And if someone is telling you that, they are lying to you. And if you are thinking that, it's because you have the wrong idea and definition of what critical race theory is. So because Kimber Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw came up a help to define what critical race theory is, and because one of her books is a feature, as a suggested reading, then DeSantis has decided to torpedo the African American Studies program. Now, remember, there are many, there are about, I'm thinking there are about six different parts to this whole, um, to the African American Studies curriculum. I think it was like six, six or seven, six, seven or eight different parts to it. Queer theory is only one. Then I, I believe he also says that um, the course also uh, teaches or talks about um, how there should be an abolishment of prisons. And the reason he came up with that was because of Dr. Angela Davis is featured. And Dr. Angela Davis has been an advocate for prison reform. There are a lot of black and brown bodies that are being in, that are incarcerated right now. Our prisons do need reform, but whenever we use the word reform, a certain political party likes to turn reform into abolish. Just like when people said, that's back in 2020, when a lot of people were saying our police departments need to be reformed. And that 
taxes, our taxes should be withheld from police departments who are not trying to reform themselves. But a certain political party turned that into, oh, we want to get away, we want to abolish the police. That's not what was said. That's not what was said. Reform has nothing to do with getting rid of. Reform is we're going to take what we have and we're going to do better. That's what reform means. It means to overhaul something. That's what reform means. But because of politics, because people, because of politics, let's just, let's just say it, then reform becomes abolishing. Angela Davis will be the first person to tell you that there are some people who deserve to be up under the uh, jail. She'll be the first to tell you that. But there are also certain there are also certain people, certain judges, certain lawyers, certain uh, district attorneys who are inherently racist, who are throwing black men and black women and black children into jail for things that, and, and giving them sentences that they would not have necessarily given their white white counterparts. If you don't believe me, then you should be watching or listening to uh, Exonerated on the Clay Kane show on Sirius XM. If you don't believe it, there are so many black and brown bodies that are being exonerated who've been sitting up under the jail for 28 years, for 30 years, for 40 years. Who are there because they shouldn't, they shouldn't, for one thing, they shouldn't be there. That's number one, because they were, they were um, found guilty of a crime they did not commit. Or they were thrown in jail for some trumped up marijuana charges. You know, you know how we like to do, it's called the, um, the, um, the laws that, that, that President Clinton put into action back in the 90s where people were going to jail for, for having just a little for a little bit of crack on them or a little bit of cocaine or whatever on them or a little bit of weed, throw everybody in jail forever for 20, 30, 40 years. You know, that's unjust sentencing. Unjust sentencing. Now, if you want to go ahead and believe the unjust sentencing doesn't happen, that people are basically, you know, that this, this system in America, this justice system that we have in America, you want to go ahead and you want to believe that it's super just, that justice is blind in America, you go ahead and believe that. I'm not going to stop you. But there are so many people right now who have proven that the justice system in this country, no, justice is not blind. Justice is wide open, especially if you are black. If you are black, the scales of justice nine times out of ten are against you. We all know that. And it's been like that since the beginning of black people setting foot in this country. And that is the truth. You don't have to believe me. You can disagree with me, but go to the library and pick up a book and you will find out that I'm telling you the truth. And see, that is the kind of thing, those are the kind of truths that DeSantis doesn't want to be addressed in his public schools. Let's be honest. Uh, what did he say? He said the other day, um, you know, communists are in this program. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Guess what? Angela Davis is a communist. True. But black people are not monolithic. Every black person you meet is not exactly a Democrat. Black people are not monolithic. We all believe different things.
And what's wrong with that? Nothing. But of course, there's something wrong with it. If you are Ron DeSantis and your agenda is to what? To oppress black people. Then that's your agenda. Your agenda is, oh, Angela Davis is featured in this? Up, oh, get rid of it. Kimberly Carl Crenshaw in it? Oh, get rid of it. I mean, if we can't have for African American studies that just talk about the basics, we don't need it. And what's the basics of African American studies? You know what I'm talking about. Dr. Martin Luther King, the March on Washington, Rosa Parks on the bus. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe the um, maybe SNCC and the uh, Freedom Ride. Maybe the uh, the uh, the uh, lunch counter sit-ins. We can throw that in. You know, that's basic African American history. That's basic modern African American history. And you know, I'm surprised that uh, I wonder if Malcolm X shows up <laughs> in African American studies. You know, and if he does show up, how does he show up? Because a lot of white people feel that Malcolm X is problematic. Hell, a lot of people feel that Martin Luther King is pro uh, problematic. You know, but there is this, this sanitizing that has happened when it comes to American history. And when it most, most importantly comes to African American history and Native American history, because we all know what happened? We African Americans are not here because we got on uh we got on the uh the good ship lollipop and sailed over here and said we're gonna have a good old time here in the Americas. That's that did not happen. It didn't happen like that for us. As Malcolm X said, Plymouth Rock landed on us. That's how we found ourselves over here. And ever since that period of time, white Americans have embraced the fact that, yes, that's what we did to you. And guess what? Get over it. And guess what? We, you are not going to make us feel guilty for what we did because that is what happened. We kidnapped you. We raped you. We starved you. We abused you. Okay. Because we had things to do. We had money to make. Okay? Guess what? You're not slaves anymore. All right? So get over it. And no, we're not going to give you any reparations. Which is one of the other reasons why this AP program, this African American Studies program was torpedoed because there's discussion, uh, a, a segment of the studies about reparations, the reparation movement. No, we're not going to give you reparations for what? Why should we give you reparations? Okay, we're not giving you anything. As a matter of fact, I didn't enslave you. What happened in slavery, that was a long time ago. You should have asked for reparations back then. But, you know, this is 2023. Don't be asking us about no reparations because we're not giving you anything. Okay? Right? No. Black people are due reparations. Because we were the ones that built this country off of the sweat and the blood of our backs. Okay? It's called generational wealth is what it's called. We deserve some of that generational wealth. How many institutions are alive and doing well today and uh, off of slave money? off of income from slavery, from the slave economy. How many? A lot. A lot. You don't believe me? Go to the library, look it up.
And we talk about reparations. Um, wait a minute. As, as crazy as it sounds, the Native Americans got reparations. They were able to get their land, you know, even though the land that was con that was given to them was continuously, continuously chipped off and chipped away by the American government. But there is land set aside for Native Americans. They're called reservations. And then certain tribes here, uh, also, they get to have uh, casinos and whatnot. It's not a lot, but it's something. We got nothing. When the Japanese were placed into in uh, concentration camps here in America during the 1940s, during World War II, after the war, they got reparations. Explain to me, in 10 words or less, why black people do not deserve reparations. In 10 words or less, you tell me why black Americans should not receive reparations. And you can break it down, say, well, you know, that was a long time ago. It doesn't matter. You can say, well, you know, my, my, it wasn't me. I didn't enslave you. My grandmother didn't enslave you. You know, uh, that was the past. You can go into all, you can say all those things. But let me tell you something. America would not be America today if it hadn't been for black people. Not at all. Not at all. Every major facet of industry in this country happened because of slavery. Now, you can you can doubt me on that too, but go to the library, look it up. Because I wouldn't say anything that was not true and based in fact. I just wouldn't. On the heels of that, let's talk Bethune Cookman real quick. The Bethune Cookman college controversy is really, really crazy. And the college decided that they were going to uh, not uh, solidify their contract. Well, their 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 negotiations, contract negotiations with uh, former NFLer Ed Reed, based on the fact that uh, last week he went on a rant about the conditions of the campus and the campus grounds over there at Bethune Cookman and uh, in Daytona, Florida. And I, I'm guessing that you know the department will the president and the board of directors, they were just, you know, they were like, oh, well, you know, his his uh, comments and his statements do not align with this institution and we're a Christian institution and his, the, his, his, his ideology and ours do not line up. So, you know, we decided to part ways. So they're basing that on the fact that while he was ranting about the, 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 the campus grounds and how Yankee and nasty they were, there was some degrading hip hop playing in the background. Now, as usual, when you look at something when you analyze something, you can't just analyze the surface. And see, I already knew that Bethune-Cookman College or University, I already knew what the conditions looked like up there because my daughter-in-law was a student at Bethune-Cookman back in 2017, 2017. And 
my husband and I traveled up to Daytona with my son. Well, travel Well, my son was living there as well at the time. So we traveled up to Daytona to visit my son and his door and his and his girlfriend at the time. And we went on campus. And we saw what that campus looks like. And it brought tears to my eyes. I even said, I went on a rant. How dare this school be named after Mary McLeod Bassoon and it looks like this. I saw Mary McLeod Bassoon's house. I was I said that if she could see the way this place looks, she would be upset. It's a disgrace the way Mary the way uh uh, uh Bethune Cookman College look. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace to that woman named Mary McLeod Bethune. It's a disgrace. And there were other scandals going on at Bethune Cookman University. That they don't really want to talk about, but it was it was there was a lot of other scandals going on there, and when that young when that's uh, when um, Ed Reed said that homeless people could just walk through the campus, come into the building, when he said that, and other students confirmed it, my son confirmed that because he used to warn his his um his girlfriend he would tell her to be careful when she would be walking through campus in the early evening or at night because there is no security none it's dangerous anybody could walk up over there my daughter-in-law also told me that when she stayed in the dorms the dorm conditions was terrible Bathrooms not working properly. Mold in the walls. That it wasn't clean. So you cannot tell me. You cannot tell me. With Thune Cookman University uh, president and board of directors, you cannot tell me that you got rid of Ed Reed because of his his uh his his conduct didn't line up or his rant didn't line up with your Christian values. Because when I walked onto that campus, that campus in cleanliness is so far away from God is ridiculous. That campus was a hot mess. And you guys are talking about, oh, his, 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 what well, his, his attitudes does not line up with our Christian values. You have no Christian values. What do you mean? The place is filthy. I was shocked and appalled. Now, I live in a community where there is uh, where USF resides and the University of Tampa resides. And when you go over onto those campuses, those campuses are clean. Okay? Clean. Security. I'm sure those kids can walk on and off campus or come home from work at night and be and feel safe. Secure. So why can't our campus look like that? Why can't a black, a historically black college or university, why can't that college, Bethune Cookman College, look, <clears throat> excuse me, as clean and shiny and vibrant as the you know, University of South Florida over here by me or the University of Tampa? Explain that because I certainly wasn't expecting it when I saw it. I was not expecting the horror of what I saw over at Bethune Cookman when I was there in 2017. My daughter in love and my son eventually got a an apartment together in Daytona because of the fact that the dorms were so terrible.
So my daughter in love and my son pulled their resources together to get an apartment. So she wouldn't have to live like that. So she could be safe. That's what we're talking about here. While we're we're at, and why I, I don't and when one breath we're talking about um, DeSantis uh, getting rid of an African American studies program. Here is why. In another breath, we need African American studies because we need to be teaching our children uh, their history, the history of who we are, so that they can have pride in what they have. Mary McLeod Bethune was a, was a, was she started her school in one room. She she desired it was her mission that black students learn that they are taught so they can go on and have objective and progressive And, 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 and contributable, lie, to be able to contribute to society and have great, well-rounded lives in the end. That's what Mary McLeod Thone was all about. That's why African-American studies is so important. So that we can learn about people about like Mary McLeod Bethune. And if you ask me, I believe there are some grown-ups that need to be looking into the information that was featured on that in that curriculum uh, for the Af for the African American Studies program. Some of us black, some of us black people, black Americans, we need to be looking into that information as well. We need to become educated, educate ourselves. Because obviously we don't have it. We're not thinking properly. We're not processing the knowledge that, that the collective memory that we have, we're not processing it, processing it. We're not accessing it. Because there is no way, there is no way that Black Floridians should be allowing any of this mess to happen. There is no way that there should be a silent Black Floridian in this state. Everybody, all of us should be upset. All of us should be enraged. All of us should be enraged about what's happening at Bethune Cookman University. All of us should be enraged about the fact that crazy Governor DeSantis is going to tell us, going to tell us what African American studies should look like. Bump him. Bump him. How you going to tell us? what should be put or placed in an African-American studies program? How are you going to supersede the knowledge and information that over 12 different African-American scholars How are you going to supersede the experience and the education of over a dozen African-American scholars who came together and gave their input, helped to put this, this, this program together. And here you are going to tell us that it lacks educational value. Bump you, Governor DeSantis. There is nothing in the African-American experience in this country that lacks educational value. There is nothing, nothing in African history that lacks educational value, sir. And all of us, 
all of us black Floridians, we need to be on top of this and we should be furious. And in some kind of way, some way, we all should re, we all should be raising our voice, our voices, our collective voices and saying, no, we're not going to go down like that. You don't get to tell us what is appropriate for our black kids our our black children to know you don't get to tell us that you're all for parental rights you're all for the parents having something to say about how uh their children are educated well guess what governor DeSantis, black floridian black floridian parents have something to say about this and we are not happy about it we are not happy and we want our kids to have the opportunity to make the choice to take this class and to be able to receive college credit for it. That's what we want. And back to you. Bethune Cookman University, we Black Floridian parents want accountability. That's what we want. When we send our kids to that university, to your school, we want accountability. We want those grounds clean. We want security. We want those gates fixed for security and safety of our children. We want clean dorms. We want locker rooms. We want every bathroom to work. We want heat. We want air conditioning in the summertime. We want a clean atmosphere for learning. We want everything that University of South Florida has and that the University of Tampa has and the University of Florida has. We want that. And we deserve it for our children. And if you black folks up there at Bethune Cookman can't get it right, then we parents are going to make sure that you are held accountable for your actions. That is what we black Floridian parents want. And if you guys can't get it together up at Bethune Cookman University, Bethune Cookman College, then guess what? You're going to have to answer to the parents. Because, as the United Negro College Fund used to say, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. So that's why it needs to be developed and poured into AP African American Studies Program and Bethune Cookman College. All right, so that's all I have to say about that today. Thank you so much for hanging out with me here in the tiny studio. If you haven't already subscribed to Simply Nails Tiny Studio, please go ahead and subscribe now and hit the notifications button so that you will always know when I am about to pop on into the tiny studio to talk to you about all things dreadlocks, all things vintage coach and of course all things crochet plus more and what's the more we have our wonderful book club yes and of course crocheting and tea with nail fun time. <laughs> so thank you so much for hanging out with me. If you would like to continue this conversation, drop down in the comment section and we can continue talking about either Bethune Cookman College and that controversy, or we can start, or we can talk about, um, uh, we can talk about Governor DeSantis, whatever it is that you would like to talk about. We can talk about it down in the comment section. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Have a great day.
and I'll see you soon here in the tiny studio. Bye-bye.